Cinema, in its purest form, was the silent era. Black and white silent films captivated the world. Then came sound. In the electrical recording of sound, there is employed a pickup microphone. Then came TV, and then came color. Color was great, but it almost obliterated the art of black and white cinematography. We can't see in black and white. It's another world. That's what makes it even more special. So let's take the color down to zero, adjust the contrast and brightness, and pretend that some things are just better in black and white. Alex Proyas' The Crow could possibly be the most 90s movie of the 90s. It's like a hot topic department store come to life, but it's also an excellent film and one that is as good today as it was when it was released in 1994. The vibe and mood of the film is modern noir, but director Proyas' eye just likes to lean into that, as was seen in one of our previous episodes on Dark City that he directed also. Much like the graphic novel source, it's not hard to turn the color down on this film and make it even better in black and white. The Crow stars Brandon Lee as a victim of a home invasion on Halloween that leaves both himself and his new bride Shelley dead. The perpetrators of the crime are part of an organized inner city gang that has pretty much free reign over the entire city. Lee stars as Eric Draven, a rock musician that is resurrected from beyond to take vengeance over the gang led by the vicious leader Top Dollar, played by Michael Wincott, in an epic performance. I want all of you boys to be able to look me straight in the eye one more time and say, ARE WE HAVING FUN OR WHAT?! Eric's police sergeant friend and teen Sarah, played by Ernie Hudson and Rochelle Davis respectively, both help Eric in his quest for vengeance. There are iconic scenes in this film, like the one in which Draven is first resurrected in the graveyard, and his subsequent return to his apartment which overlooks the city. It is also here where the actual legend of the crow and its relationship to the dead is beautifully set up. Eric's backstory is crafted through carefully placed flashbacks, as his vengeance is strategically extracted throughout the film. The first being a pawn shop owner, played by the late great John Polito. Is that gasoline I smell? No, man. No! Ah! No! Lee plays his role with a bluster that he had not shown in any of his previous performances before. Without it, the film would seem like a drab, stylistic goth fashion show, but Lee elevates this piece and all of it into a beautiful work of art. Director of photography Darius Wolski's visuals in this film are breathtaking, like the art of its comic counterpart. They each have storytelling purpose to move us through Eric's story of revenge and grieving. Some shots are just downright majestic in their execution. Combined with production designer Alex McDowell's exquisite work, the film pops like a graphic novel on film. <laughs> Wincott and actress Bai Ling also do a magnificent job as an evil couple who revel in darkness and the black and white only amplifies their exploits. We must also acknowledge that this film was one of the first Western films to embrace the Hong Kong style of filmmaking that was just making its first appearance stateside. Here I am, huh? The Avenger. The killer of killers. Nice outfit. The editing and the action scenes bring to mind John Woo's A Better Tomorrow and The Killer. The way Lee uses both pistols at once is right out of Wu's heroic bloodshed gun fu genre films with Chow Yun Fat. And it makes sense, as Lee, like his father Bruce Lee, made several Hong Kong actioners before starring in films here in the US, so he knew what was coming around the corner. This film is also a time capsule of 90s alternative rock, with a soundtrack that can almost top the film itself. 
but here it works, and as previously stated, it is a film of the 90s through and through. The 90s were a time of cinema that were rejecting the Reaganomics of the 80s, so to speak, and this film peels back the darker layers of what that decade was all about. Your daughter is out there on the streets waiting for you. It's reactionary in a way that is both creatively and narratively satisfying. The film does have a purpose. Its purpose is righting wrongs. It's a fantasy, and a dark one at that, but it's one we've all thought about. Had you been given the second chance to not only make things right, but to burn all the bad things down at the same time? The Black and White is a great way to rewatch this film, to see things through a little bit of a different lens, so to speak. At times, it makes the film have an even harder edge to it than it already does. Had Lee continued on in his career, he might have had the opportunity to surpass the action genre he had embraced. There have been multiple sequels to The Crow, and none of them have been able to put the complete package together like this one did. It is a perfect time capsule of the mood of its day, and as such, it may be impossible to replicate in our current climate. It's a tragic love story at its core, but the journey is a dark fantasy that sadly reminds us that vengeance is sometimes as human as is breathing. Much like Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, it's difficult to find a bad shot in the film. Any frame of this film could be hung on a wall as art. Taking the color out is simply an experiment worth taking here, and that's why The Crow just works better in black and white.